gentlemen, welcome to BODW 2020. I'm Dennis Yu, your MC today. We now have an we now have an outstanding series of short presentations highlighting design innovation in the health sector. Joining us, we have Nari Kelly, an innovation scientist. Stacy Chang, the executive director of the Design Institute for Health. Dr. Yi Min Ko, the managing director of health and employee benefits of Exa Hong Kong. Dr. Hong Ki Chang, former deputy hospital chief executive from Cheng Kuan O Hospital. And Michael Fong, the Chief Information Officer of the CUHK Medical Center. Do you have a discussion led by Dr. Edmund Nee, the Executive Director of Hong Kong Design Center? Please welcome all of the speakers. Hello and welcome to BODW 2020. We want to thank all of you for joining us from across the world this week. We have an exciting panel to talk about people-centered health and care. Design is an integral part of our lives. The pandemic plays a vivid reminder of how vulnerable the humankind is and how entrenched, fragmented and even incoherent the global healthcare systems are. There remain many healthcare challenges to be tackled, such as diseases lacking remedies, aging population, equitable and affordable access to quality healthcare, fair redistribution of healthcare resources, etc. With changing lifestyles, advances in science, and smart use of technologies and design thinking, we are better prepared for system and service innovations of healthcare. And even insurers find a need to innovate their products and services to better meet the needs of people and support empowered lives. And this session will highlight new shifts and paradigms of future healthcare. The intersection of people centered design and system thinking will illuminate us with new paths and what the society needs. Now, let me quickly you know, to bring back you know, uh, our panel members you know, from, um, uh, for this session. And joining me in the Hong Kong uh, studio, we have um, Dr. Cheng. Okay. Now, Dr. Cheng, thank you very much you know, for joining us today. Thank you. And, um, and I understand you will be talking about you know, uh, designing people-centered uh, health system you know, for us in a minute. Okay. And then we have um, Michael. Michael, you are the CIO of the CHK Medical Center. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah, you must be very busy right now because you have the new hospital actually launching very soon. Yeah, yeah. In January, right? Or yeah, in a month's time. Oh, goodness. So thank you very much for investing the time with us. And we have uh, Yiman Ko um, of um, EXA. So thank you very much you know, for joining us. Thank you. So you'll be sharing with us you know, some of your new uh, service offerings using design thinking. Wow, that's uh, looking forward to that. Now, um, without further ado, I would like you know to bring to the studio uh, Stacy Zhang, Executive Director, Design Institute of Health of University of Texas at Austin. Edmund, it's good to be with you. I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person. Maybe next year. All right. Good to have you here, Stacy. And we have um, Larry Keeley, innovation scientist and president and co-founder of Doppling Group and author of the 10 types of innovation. Larry. Edmund, what a pleasure to be back at the Business of Design Week. I totally appreciate the brilliant way you've redesigned it for a virtual presentation this year. Smart, and I know how much hard work that's been for you and all your staff. Thank you so much. Well, it's really great you know, to have both of you, you know, joining us from um, uh, Larry, you are from Chicago, and um, um, Stacy, you are from Austin. Wow, thank you very much for joining us. Okay, now Larry, I understand that you will be sharing with us about um, um, the topic relating to new shifts and paradigms for future health. So for about 10 minutes, I would like to, you know, to pass the stage to you now. Thanks, Edmund, happy to do it. Um, and I have a brief provocation that I want us to think about. 
uh, and then it'll hopefully set up a great conversation that you and your panel have arranged. What you should see is a slide now where the um, emphasis is so often presented in almost every image you see in popular depictions of modern healthcare, where it's a medical professional, a doctor of some sort, using some form of technology to try to develop a deeper understanding of a patient's condition. That is certainly one of the big shifts going on in healthcare. And yet, I'm going to, in this few minutes that I have to provoke our conversation, I'm going to suggest to you that it's really only about two to five percent of the problem of delivering brilliant healthcare in a human centered way. In China, interestingly enough, the challenge is to try to figure out how to increase capacity for the huge amount of, of uh, growing middle class people who expect great quality health care. So increasingly, you see remote diagnostic centers like this one using artificial intelligence to try to figure out how to give a patient a great diagnosis in a way that is affordable enough that it is effective for the entire growing nation of China. Both of these things are really interesting to think about. And as my sort of way of introducing Edmund and for all of our colleagues on the panel and all of our guests at the Business of Design Week, I'd like to introduce these four puzzles that I believe are at the heart of the modern development of, of design and the modern development of a great healthcare system. Uh, so this first one, which unfortunately I can't see the way you guys have me. Can, I, can we close up on the slides again? Thank you. Um, what medical professionals now need to do is to think about both individuals and the population as a whole. That's very interesting because doctors have been taught forever that what they're supposed to focus on is the patient in front of me. But now when we look at complex conditions, whether it's pandemics or the most costly and common conditions for people's health care, you actually have to start to look at the broader audience. Population health is what that's typically called. Second thing that's a puzzle we need to solve collectively when we design great modern healthcare is to see what a profound shift is happening in global health norms. So for instance, just to pick one interesting example, in the history of humanity on our planet, throughout time until very recently, the wealthiest people were fat. And the unwealthy people, the people who were struggling and working hard for a living were really quite thin, almost you know, starving. This is flipped now. And it's really interesting to recognize that to a very large extent, the pattern we're in now is that if you eat the most affordable food that's designed to be very tasty and very compelling so that you eat a lot of it, you will become overweight and you will become unhealthy. This is a lifestyle issue, and yet we're increasingly expected to treat these lifestyle issues in the way we give modern health care to individuals. A third puzzle, really interesting to think about, is how we sort of think about what it means to be healthy. Is healthy fixing your body's symptoms right now, the way Western medicine treats it? Is it more like Eastern medicine, where you look at the balance and people's overall you know, signals in the body and try to design whether you're using, um, you know, any form of care, um, the basic balance in your body so that you live a longer, healthier life? Or are we spe specifically going to start predicting what individuals are going to go through and designing for their particular conditions and their longer, healthier life? And inside of all of that, Every government everywhere in the world is faced with a big challenge. People expect perfect care. They expect it no matter what it costs, and they expect it to be free. So if you're not careful, any thoughtful government has to figure out how to cover these very costly conditions and these very costly care methods without sort of making it impossible to invest in the other things that society also needs. It's a very tricky challenge that challenges leaders around the world, no matter what the political systems are. So let's go forward a little bit and see if we can't figure out what might be some important principles that get us to the important point of connected health, Edmund, and the idea of human-centered care. I'm going to suggest four things are worth our our thought process and our conversation together. First, this is the biggest time of change in the history of the world. 
we really do need to understand that connected health is going to use data in brand new ways. A second and really interesting point about that is that uh, China's challenge is to grow its capacity for sophisticated care. Uh, there are no country in the world, with the possible exception of India, faces a larger challenge in terms of streamlining and mainstreaming and scaling up really good quality care to be able to care for all of the citizens in a population. In the U.S., which you can use as sort of a laboratory to learn from, sometimes learning bad lessons, not good lessons, we are trying to find new ways to provide care and to make it affordable. That has been the challenge ever since Obama was president. And as you've seen, we've managed to sort of turn it into a political uh, challenge more than anything else. And finally, all of us at Business of Design Week should be concerned with how we humanize care and how we think about it as something that works well for patients and is much better for the providers. So that whether you're a nurse or a doctor or a specialist of any kind, you bring your very best talents and your very best attitudes to care for the humans you're trying to, to address. So I only have a couple of minutes and I wanna make sure that we do what we can to make this come alive. Uh, some of you know, I've been a presenter at BODW many times. I've written a book, which is much of these principles are derived from called The 10 Types of Innovation. It is available in 15 languages, um, um, but the central part of the book is that it teaches that you need to think about innovation in a sophisticated way. <clears throat> Some 22 years ago, we discovered 10 basic types of innovation, which when you think about them in a balanced way, allows you to come up with bolder ideas that are easier to implement and harder to copy. The reason this is important for all of us to understand, we're going to be hearing from Stacy next and the great ways that Stacy has applied similar ideas to the brand new innovations in, in Austin, Texas, or the new uh, hospital coming, as you'll hear about, in Hong Kong itself. But to a large extent, engineers think about making things that are platform-centric. Business leaders think about how to make it affordable, and designers figure out how to make it a great experience. All of those things matter. To a very large extent, the core of innovation, when you just look at the pattern of innovations and how people are investing money in China, they're investing it in the technology. In the US, we've invested tons in technology many years ago. Now we're investing more in the business models and in the human care models. The reason this matters to all of us at the Business of Design Week conference is to be able to understand that innovation, sophisticated innovation, the kind that works, is inherently a team sport. You need talent from business schools, you need talent from engineering schools, and you need talent from design schools in order to get this right. In my little attempt to try to develop a crystal ball for us, I've got three things that I think should be useful for us to understand. One, patient data is at the core of everything. We need to see it increasingly as the data in addition to the patient's symptoms. The second thing is as much care as possible, especially post-COVID, needs to be remote so that it's less risky for the caregiver and it's less risky for the population as a whole. And of course, we have to figure out always how to deliver care with human empathy, with, with the kind of affection that allows it to to sort of be received in the warmest possible way. I've broken that down for us as our provocation, just in a couple moments, into three big stretches. How do we care for patients? And to a very large extent, the world over, people are investing fortunes in trying to get patient data health records to come together with devices in a profound way to be able to model what we know about any particular patient at any particular moment. In remote care, a very important um, investment throughout uh, Asia, especially in Singapore and in China, mainland China, people are learning to stitch together devices and sensors and all kinds of feedback systems uh, and usually attaching artificial intelligence models and predictive analytics. So this is a big frontier of remote care. Uh, especially now that we've got intelligent devices in our homes that we can talk to so that the caregivers can get pretty good feedback about what's going on with you or your family members. And of course, what designers have known for a very long time is that the heart of care 
wherever you are in your journey in your life, whether you're a child or, or a healthy uh, young adult or starting to age or starting to get complicated conditions, the heart of all care is to do it with love and with empathy. Last provocation that I think might be useful for us, Edmund, in setting up our conversation together is to talk about the first time in about 20 years that a new medical school has been built in the United States. This one has been built at the Kaiser Permanente campus in San Francisco, Oakland, California. And in this new medical school, the dean starting about three years ago asked people like me, what should we be thinking about when we design a new generation of medical school? And ultimately she did a brilliant job of deciding to focus on two new things. The first new thing is the idea that innovation and medical practice now is always a team sport from the beginning and always a data science. So what's new in this brand new medical school is every single student is taught how to work in teams and every single student is taught to look at three screens for every patient. That patient's data, data from patients like that patient, and data from the community that patient comes from. And this is a brand new way to think about and to practice medicine. We have many other panelists to hear from Edmund, but I thought I would give those as a little bit of puzzles and a great way to start our conversation together. Well, thank, thank you very much, Larry. I think it's uh, very thought provoking. In fact, I think we can we can extend you know, to many of the attributes uh, into our conversations. And it's very interesting. You talk about you know, the design school, business school. In fact, I think we need to build the interfaces with other non-related you know, uh, 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 area, seemingly, you know, such as engineering is very important, science, arts as well. And, and also, I think it's very important. End of the day, we all want to human, humanize you know, the healthcare services. And it's always easy said than done. So I think I hope that you know through the further conversation with the panel members, you know we can enrich you know the dialogue a little bit. Now next, I would like you know to invite uh, Stacy you know to share some of the system innovation perspective. You know I know that at Austin, you know the Design Institute of Health that um, uh, Stacy you are you are leading over there, and there are really ambitious plan going on. Can you tell us about you know the the, the aspirations and the system level? Uh, perspectives, you know, so to speak. I'm very happy to. Again, thanks for having me. Thank you. So it's uh, no surprise that uh, uh, Larry and I uh, share some very adjacent ideas. It's always a, a pleasure to share a stage, even if virtually with him. And so I think you'll see some themes reinforced here and, and also some expanded on as well. Um, the title of my talk uh, is uh, Health Systems Innovations and Change Leadership. But I think there's a really important distinction I want to draw forward first. Um, and that is that um, this, this title refers to health systems and not healthcare systems, and that's a very important difference. Healthcare systems is a reference to the systems we currently know, right? Hospitals, clinics that holds nurses and doctors, um, systems that we've had for a long time and are designed to treat the sick. More accurately, they should probably be called sick care systems. Um, and these legacy systems are originally designed to treat very specific things, right? The treatment and recovery of patients who suffered from acute trauma or injury, uh, or infectious disease, right? In this moment, we recognize how important that is. And largely, they've been very successful. Even in this COVID pandemic, um, the, these systems are responding as they're designed, you know, treating patients when they're infected. In some regions, the COVID surges are testing the capacities of the system, but that's really a more public health uh, failure than it is a failure of the healthcare system. Um, but uh, I think there's, a, um, there's an important point and a broader issue around the design of health systems, which I want to talk about, and something that we were contending with even before the COVID pandemic, um, and that is the rise of chronic disease. So most of what makes us sick today has nothing to do actually with infectious diseases or physical injury. What makes most of us ill today are conditions like obesity and diabetes and high blood pressure and depression and other mental illnesses. And what's important about that is that the causes are social and behavioral and environmental factors instead of traditional biomedical factors. Um, but our hospitals are actually still designed for addressing primarily biomedical issues, not the social, behavioral, and environmental factors. In essence, the modern nature of disease has changed quite dramatically, but our modern healthcare systems really haven't. So um, if you look at 
the statistics chronic or sometimes what we call non communicable diseases account for about 71% of all deaths globally, what you see here in blue. And yet our systems of care were originally designed to address the issues you see in red and green, right? Communicable or types of diseases and injury. You know, even in this pandemic, which should be addressed by the system design for the red, having a chronic condition in the blue increases your risk very significantly of getting ill from the virus. Um, um, and, and here's the crux of the problem. Um, we don't solve those chronic diseases in a hospital or a clinic. You know, are more modern than the picture you see here, obviously. But fundamentally, they're very much the same. Um, this is not where you go to cure a chronic disease. You can't go to a clinic or hospital and get an injection and cure your diabetes. Instead, most of these chronic conditions are solved in a much broader continuum of care that crosses well into your lived life. Um, so it used to be that we separated life from disease. If you acquired a disease, the key to living was to eliminate the disease. Right? Uh, now, uh, life is very much uh, interwoven with disease. You don't cure chronic diseases. They generally persist for a lifetime. Right? And so the truth of the matter is, um, uh, let's see, make sure my slides work here. Yeah, good. Um, the, is that life and disease are held uh, in close uh, proximity to each other. Um, care and therapy happen in the same venues of life, at home, at work, at play, within your community. We have to move from a very curative mindset to a much more of a management mindset, right? This shift means that we are living not in spite of disease, but actually with it. Um, so the shift uh, is a big one. It's moving from really moving care from clinical venues or venue of life. And it attends some other really meaningful shifts as well, and I want to go through those. So instead of measuring and monitoring biomedical factors, which is really what we did in the clinical venues, we have to start to measure and monitor um, um, social, behavioral, and environmental factors. It uses technology very differently uh, and very different technology, and, it, um, and it, it substantiates a very different care model instead of focusing on individuals, Larry suggested that we have to think about the population. And that's absolutely true. You have to think of it at that level. But actually, the first step into that when you move into the venue of life is actually the household that surrounds the individual. Uh, if you think about the beliefs and the habits and the influences of those around the individual, um, they, also, they all have a huge effect. For example, if you're going to change the way an individual eats or how active an individual is, you're actually going to have to change the habits of the entire family, what they eat, how they socialize, and how they interact. Um, care that's delivered in clinical venues depends mostly on professionals like doctors and nurses. Care that happens in the venues of life really is much more self-diagnosed and self-administered with professionals as guides and coaches in bed. That's a very different care model than we're used to. And really, I think the point here is a consequence of having disease management residing in a live daily context is that the experience of being ill will actually merge with the experience of simply living, right? The two will become indistinguishable. And so that places very new demands on the healthcare industry, which will have to immediately begin to address the burden of a responsive, personalized, self-directed, on-demand consumer life, which we're all used to in our normal consumer lives, a set of expectations that Healthcare has largely ignored, really, until now. So, um, just as a brief example, in the work that we've done here in Austin, um, we've actually recognized how fragmented care is now. Um, uh, we we put the healthcare system and provide the center. But really, really, we have to think about redesigning to enable the patient to have agency and ownership through the journey. Uh, even as we were designing our clinical experience, we uh, launched clinics here a couple of years ago. We looked at the existing model and said, we really do have to reimagine it. Um, we have to reimagine it to a model where a coordinated team of care providers, what we call integrated practice unit, comes together collectively to identify all the factors that could affect a patient's trajectory. In our clinic, you're just as likely to meet a nutritionist, a physical therapist, a mental health counselor, or a financial counselor in your visit as you are to meet a doctor and a nurse. And the goal is to identify any and all of the factors that affect the outcomes of your disease, not just the biomedical one, and then to enable and empower the patient to take responsibility for their own care, especially once they leave the clinic. 
So our clinics look quite different. This is the entry to our clinic. You know, one of the big uh, innovations is that we actually removed the waiting room. And if you think about waiting rooms for a second, um, they are essentially a pressure relief valve for the healthcare system, right? That's trying to run at maximum efficiency. Uh, because the time of the medical professional is so tightly constrained, we put patients, actually we put them in temporary warehouses, we just call them waiting rooms, so that the next patient can be extracted at the pleasure of the system whenever a professional is ready for them. And this signals to the patient that their priorities are actually nowhere near as important as the system is, uh, system's priorities are, and it disables and disempowers the, the patient as an agent of their own care. So in eliminating the waiting rooms in our clinic, it was a really important signal to our patients that not only do we respect them, but that we also need them to be agents in their own care, that we're going to design an experience that enables them to do that. Even more importantly, it forced us to revisit the entire operational workflow of the clinic and how teams are organized around their work in order to actually build a much more efficient and effective model. Um, uh, this, we, we ended up writing uh, a huge uh, um, article for New England Journal of Medicine about what it took to actually get rid of waiting rooms and what it meant for the model. Um, I'm happy to share that with the audience um, if they're interested. Um, the only way to understand how to make changes in a system like this is actually to map the different elements of the system understand the exchanges of value, the priorities of different stakeholders, and actually the collisions that occur between them. Mapping those interactions is the only way to, to trace how a change in one part of the system will eventually evince the change you want to see in another part of the system. So uh, I'm going to include a few thoughts here, right? You know, the, the title of the session really is about connected health. And yes, absolutely, technologies like electronic health records and AI and automation, remote monitoring, they all matter a tremendous amount. They are enabling technologies. But I'd actually like to shift it to a slightly broader perspective and ask, you know, have we considered what connected health means at a system level? It means connection across the needs of care, connection with professional guidance when you're not in the clinical venue, connection with the informal caregivers in your household who actually, who actually provide the majority of care for the family. What does it really mean when we actually think about connected health that way? You know, I began this um, talk uh, suggesting that there's some, some thought for leadership as well, and I'll, I'll, I'll add this to the publication Larry did. As leaders in healthcare, we have to think about how we expand our purview beyond the existing legacy model, how we extend the models of care to broach these new venues of life, and in doing so, how we establish new domains of expertise and practice. Um, the opening slide uh, really said this, which is that the modern nature of disease has changed and the modern healthcare system has not. My hope is that actually, that the modern nature of disease has changed and the modern health system can as well in alignment. I'll end there, thank you. Thank you very much, Stacy. I think it's um, profound in a sense because it's, of course, you know, Larry talk about humanizing healthcare. And what, what comes up very, very strong from your sharing is, um, is the dynamics and interactions, you know, uh, uh, um, of all the ecosystem actors is also very important. And, and we really need, you know, to iron out and also work out, you know, the best experience for all, you know, not just, you know, for the doctors, but actually, you know, all the users, you know, of the system and the providers, so on and so forth. Now, and certainly, you know, we will uh, carry forward the uh, uh, this discussion in the conversations later. Now, um, let's bring back, you know, some of the um, perspective, you know, in Hong Kong, for example. Uh, Dr. Zhang, you know, you've been um, a very experienced, you know, hospital administrator. You've been running hospital yourself. And um, what is in your minds, you know, the, the patient-centered or people-centered approach of healthcare? Yes, uh, that's exactly one of the topics I'm going to present uh, with, with the discussion between people center and patient center. Yeah. Okay. Perhaps I would like to uh, bring this to you all. Okay. Um, good day, everybody. Today I would like to discuss uh, on two topics. One is people center, and another is connect health. Um, connect health is to provide healthcare service remotely by using information communication technology. Um, Hospital Authority, HA, is the biggest healthcare organization in Hong Kong. Uh, over the years, they have been advocating patient-centered care, just like here. Um, it is put down in the annual plan 1920. Um, the management is usually um, disease-based 
or episode um, oranger. So the doctors tend to see patients as diseased organs. Um, for example, the cardiologist just uh, look at the patient's heart, a respiratory physician are interested in the lungs, uh, et cetera. So the healthcare very often would be um, rather fragmented. But on the other hand, for uh, people-centered care, we see pe uh, patients as um, individuals at all time, not just the moment they're in front of us. So we focus on um, patient-centered care, so uh, we, we, we try to um, bring um, them what is, what is the concern to, uh, that would be our concern. So one of the um, first attempt to bring people-centered project in my hospital would be the EURES, the Enhanced Recovery of the Surgery. Um, enhanced recov Recovery of the Surgery, EURES, um, is a revolutionary way of doing surgery. Its primary aim is to improve clinical outcome. It is widely practiced in Western countries. About five years ago, our multidisciplinary team implemented EURES in Zhangguan Hospital. Um, in our design, we bond people-centered in mind, and we try to be uh, people-centered so that um, we focus on uh, what, what is their concern, what happened to them at home. So, uh, for example, under the concept of um, uh, prehabilitation, so our dietitians and physiotherapists, they will try to boost up the patient's nutrition and also the visit. We as anesthetists, we'll try to optimize the patient's medical condition and the patient is, is empowered to take an active role throughout the process. Now turn on to telemedicine. It was said that telemedicine had no role to play in Hong Kong, um, but I don't think so. Um, I think there should be a better way, a more efficient and also convenient way to deliver health care. Therefore, we implement telemedicine pilot in Zhangguan Hospital last year. This year, COVID-19 makes social distancing so important. As a result, many hospital services were suspended. And as we are well prepared, so we can respond really fast, um, we had 12 departments, over 20 services, and over 1,000 received teleconsultation. Um, so we can alleviate the situation. Um, of course, social distancing is important, but it is um, not the only benefit of telemedicine. So sorry for the very bad drawing. Um, suppose we have an um, elderly patient, but uh, wheelchair bound has hypertension and require regular clinic follow-up. For each clinic visit, um, his family has to take a day off from work accompany him to the hospital and arrange transportation and then wait for hours in the hospital and finally bring his back home. As we can see, it's a really long, long day. So with telemedicine, all this can be done at home. Um, so telemedicine can bring about um, convenience and efficiency to our patients and also to our healthcare professionals. But of course, they are a challenge to us. I think Users' acceptance, including both the patients and the doctors, um, is very important. I, for the design of such a telemedicine system, I believe a um, hybrid system with telemedicine supplementing traditional mode of consultation would be an ideal one and have, can have synergistic effect. More about the design, I think most people would consider care processes, the physical layout, hardware, software, and the network. But very often, the tone and feel, the user experience, user, uh, user interface are forgotten. These are important as this would affect the user's acceptance. Um, the picture on the right, you can see our last screen, suppose it's a really uh, smooth run, uh, good resolution. And comparing to the left one, is a small mobile device. 
you can immediately tell the difference between the two in terms of so user acceptance and experience. Okay, more about people centered. Patients are patients 24 seven, not just the moment, the hours or minutes in front of us. Outside hospitals stay at home. How can we seamlessly manage a patient and address their needs? Now, we'll come back to our patient on the wheelchair. Now he has the um, internet of medical things, the IOMT device wearable. It measures the blood pressure and then through the mobile device, transmitted to the service provider cloud, and which in turn can be connected to the healthcare provider's cloud. For example, it's the HHS cloud, and then the BP trend can be downloaded to the clinical man management system. In addition, we can have electronic health diary be developed in, an HHA, in, in a mobile app. For example, um, in our HHS system, HHA apps, uh, we call it HHA Go then the patient can keep, keep his own diary, health diary, and also um, report his symptoms. This together with the IOM team, supplement the uh, teleconsultation and make it more comprehensive. Um, the user experience, user designs are important here because very often um, the patient would be an elderly patient. So you have to make it usable so that it can be more sustainable. Okay, next, come to 5G technology. It's really exciting, really great. Um, there are um, many 5G use cases in connected health. I list a number of them here. This year, uh, we pilot remote surgery support in Jungle Road Hospital Operating Theater together with 5G support. Um, from the picture, you can see that inside the operating theater, we've got lots of camera because there are many different clinical specialties, and there are many different types of operation. Therefore, we need different types of camera capturing the video from different angles so that it can ride on the 5G network for its ultra high speed, low latency, so that ultra high definition video can be streamed to the mobile device of the surgeons, the senior surgeon who is ready to support the surgeon inside the operating theater. That senior surgeon can be at anywhere so that he can instantaneously support him. That means more efficient, better convenience, so that he, don't, he, don't have to, he doesn't have to uh, travel back to the hospital and take time. That also means more important, the most important would be the increased patient safety. Okay, this is my concluding slide. Um, there, in connected health, there are many stakeholders and enablers. I think it's the user acceptance that's the most important. Um, the users include the patient and healthcare provider. And very often, designers pay a pivotal role in others because good user design, uh, user interface and user experience is the key to the success. Okay, I think I can stop here. Mm, interesting. I think we we'll start seeing, you know, kind of a story, you know, being curated, you know, in a sense. Start off, you know, with um, the acute need, you know, to really humanize the experiences for not just patients, you know, but the care, the entire community. And then, you know, Stacey talk about, you know, the avenue of life. It's not just treating diseases, you know, so to speak. And probably, you know, to, uh, the future medicine, you know, we need, you know, to be more community-based, you know, uh, and then lead into a lot of, you know, the user cases start to be built up, you know, in, in Hong Kong, for example, in your hospital from last year. And, um, but interestingly, you know, um, there are so much information and data, you know, being generated, I guess, you know, from the, doctor side, you know, there are data, you know, coming from the patient side, and I'm sure, you know, from the community side and the whole system level. So naturally, I think if, um, 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 Michael, you know, as the chief information officer of a, of a brand new hospital, you know, coming on, uh, coming uh, 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 on stream very soon, um, very, really like, you know, to hear further from you, you know, when you plan, you know, this uh, smart hospital, you know, so to speak, okay, 
and there must be a lot of planning, a lot of um, complexity that you need to navigate. Can you share with us, you know, some of your experience here? Okay, thank you, Armin. Uh, uh, good morning, everybody. So I'm uh, Michael from coming from the uh, CUHK Medical Center. Uh, so uh, well. If you can look at the screen, this is the outlook of the new uh, hospital called the CUHK Medical Center. It's a very modern design and then it's situated right next to the um, university uh, train station uh, in Sha Tin. Okay. And the, uh, we are a, a non profit private teaching hospital, uh, wholly uh, owned by the CUHK uh, Hong Kong. And because of that academic background, so we have a very strong social mission to bridge the gaps between the healthcare services between the public and private sector. Uh, um, so uh, when we started building our hospital a few years back, so uh, because we were brand new hospitals, so we are able to integrate a lot of different uh, processes, strategies in different areas uh, during the design and build the construction stage of the hospital. And this is particularly important from the IT perspective so that we can put the network infrastructure during the design and, and uh, construction stage. Okay, so um, uh, a lot of people talk about uh, smart hospitals, but there, when we look over the internet, there is not a uh, standard definition of what a smart hospital is. but. Um, we uh, started when we started planning for this hospital. We tr we wanted to uh, adopt more IT technologies uh, um, in the in the work process, and the goals of that is to uh, will be to um, uh, increase the uh, patient outcome uh, and also increase the patient experience, and at the same time increasing work efficiency, and. Um, we try to look at our work in a different uh, perspective, in from the, uh, the care process, from the how we uh, conduct the, the care uh, medicine, and also how we manage the hospital. So we try, uh, we can categorize the work that we uh, we are doing into three streams of work. Number one is to try to build a uh, fully electronic medical record system that supports our hospital operation. And secondly, it, we try to uh, introduce more mobile apps to uh, increase the mobility uh, of all these um, uh, our staff, our workers, and patients. And the third part, of, of course, is the more um, uh, interesting topic and hot topic nowadays uh, in healthcare: the use of IoT. The so we've built a uh, what we call the integrated hospital information system that supports the different care process uh, throughout the patient journey. Say, for example, the patient, when the patient uh, books an appointment uh, to our hospital, at the time the patient comes to the hospital to do the registration and the nurse is doing the uh, triage um, um, assessments and doctors doing the consultation operations and prescribing medicine. And until the time the patient is ready to be discharged, so it's a, a very uh, big system. And the system is also connected to other, uh, what we call the departmental system, for example, laboratory systems and radiology system. Uh, so uh, that's the core uh, system that's supporting our hospital operations. So, and then we, because we are trying to aim for these paperless operations. So a lot of all these traditional um, processes, for example, uh, paper assessments, uh, signing consent forms. So we will do that in an electronic way. And then you can see that the patients can sign on the um, a notepad, notepad or their mobile phones. Okay, that's the one part of the work. And then um, for the vital sign monitors, they are integrated automatically into the uh, HIS. And then from there, you can produce an electronic uh, temperature charts from the system. So, so the second part is on the mobile part. Uh, so we, we build um, different mobile uh, apps to support different staff groups in their daily operations. For example, the nurses can use the mobile apps to do the uh, medication administration, assessment and uh, uh, shift handover, things like this. And for doctors, doctors can also look at their own patients' uh, electronic medical records uh, through their mobile phones and do some um, uh, verbal medications uh, with that. 
And for pharmacy staff, they can use their mobile phones to manage the drug inventory. And we also got a mobile, phone, uh, mobile app that patients can look at their own um, appointment schedules and different uh, electronic medical records in the, in the system right, for our hospital. And the third part is the IoT initiatives. Um, so you can see that uh, with IoT, there's going to be a lot of advantage that we can leverage on. So when we design all these different IoT initiatives, we try to look at the different um, pain points in different areas. So I'm going to highlight a few. Some of these uh, IoT initiatives, uh, including uh, uh, in the mobile, in the mo patient's mobile app, then there is a um, like an indoor wayfinding, like a Google map that we're using, but that's uh, within the hospital. So it can lead the patients to go to different departments. And then uh, with um, some real-time location tracking technology, we can locate the, the patients and the patients uh, going out of an area that they're not supposed to, then we can alert the nurses to, to improve the patient's safety. And, and we also, through the uh, um, infotainment systems, apart from looking at the uh, TV series and ordering meals, and then they can pay a visit to their uh, families, members uh, in a virtual sense. Originally, we wanted to make it more con connectable to uh, their families, but now under the COVID-19 situations, so that sounds a very um, uh, useful tool for that as well. So there are other uh, initiators on the drugs, for, uh, on the drug safety and the drug management. And then the third part, uh, I say the laboratory. We are, so in some initiatives, we are able to track each and in every single piece of specimens collected from the laboratory, uh, collected from the uh, ward. And then until the time there, we also track the path they, uh, they go until the time they reach the laboratory. So and that will help to uh, ensure the, the, the safety of patients as well. And then um, other initiatives, in, including uh, the supporting services, where we make use of RFID to help managing the different uniforms and linens. Uh, so there are a number of all these uh, different initiatives. And the hospital is due to open in a month's time. So we are looking forward to that as well. So uh, with that, I uh, thank you. Well, can't imagine the, thank you very much you know, for your sharing, Michael. Really can't imagine the level of complexity you know, that uh, is involved in the whole planning of um, services and care you know, for the community. So um, wishing it you know, all the success you know, when you're thank you. yeah, in, your, in your new journey you know, of the care services for Hong Kong. Now, um, coming to, we're talking about building the ecosystem, right? You know, dynamics with different people. And then, you know, with the care, not just talking about the venue, it's not just the hospital, okay? I think we need, you know, to, to, uh, um, to, uh, to empower people, you know, to live their life. So I guess, um, Iman, you know, in, I, I realize some of the initiative that you've been working on and uh, are pretty interesting because you, you have been talking a lot quite some time about using design thinking to ensure that the product offerings coming from insurer, for example, can really meet the needs. Now, really looking forward you know, to, to learn from you. Can you share with us your insights? Yes, uh, Edmund, thank you very much for inviting me. And I'm absolutely delighted to be here uh, with esteemed colleagues and so excited to hear that we are having new medical schools in the world like Kaiser that are training, looking at not just individuals, but households and communities. And also what Stacy said about uh, not medical insurance, he talked about medical healthcare system, but actually sick insurance and how we need to move on to, to health, uh, health and wealth and lifestyle. And then we hear all the, the very exciting uh, CUHK Medical Center. Uh, I really am excited about, wow, what I'm seeing and, and all the new uh, technology that uh, HK have talked about. So my, my, my privilege today is to share with you how we design pink medical insurance. As you can see, I'm also uh, wearing pink because uh, I, I got the idea for pink medical insurance because uh, I wanted to do something for women. And, and earlier on, we heard, right, that actually insurance, people buy them, it should actually be called sick insurance because it only covers you when you are sick. And also, 
it is very selective globally what sickness it will cover. Many in sickness are actually excluded. Then I thought, why are we doing this? Why, are, why can we not do something that actually fits in with people's real lives that they are living and is inclusive, but actually deal with all the pain points that our customers have? And that's when I thought, well, let's deal with women first, because women is, uh, well, the, the, I would say the engine of the world. And so we launched this new insurance last month, and it has gone down like a storm. And I would like to take you through the journey, how we did it. Okay, so I'll go through it quickly. Uh, doesn't go on. Ah, okay. So how, when I, when I envisage developing this, this product, what, what, what was I thinking of? I was thinking of the strong, independent women of today. Not the traditional, uh, of course, you know, uh, we, we, we still have very good traditional women of today. But if you look around, in, especially in Asia, in Hong Kong, China, Korea, Japan, or Southeast Asia, Singapore, the women that I see, they are ambitious, career-minded, and especially the millennial generation up under 40, they are leading independent lives and they want to pursue a, a, a career that actually the family and, and, and uh, lifestyle is not compromised. So how do we develop something that supports them throughout their whole life? Because something that women have that men do, don't is that we have a biological clock. So how do we assist them to, to live the best life that they can be? So we know that throughout women's whole life, they actually have uh, special needs with regards to financial critic, uh, and, and also their, their biological, uh, sexual, reproductive health and so on. So I was really keen to see whether we could do something that helps women to be their best self. We know that uh, at different life stages, from young adulthood to older women, you go through the period where you, know, you have gynecological problems, beauty always matters no matter what your age and increasingly for men, I must say, uh, yes, uh, and of course, fertility issues, especially during your childbearing years because your bodies don't wait. And of course, how do we help women with menopause, which is often an unspoken uh, issue. And of course, childcare when you are fortunate to have children. So these are some of the core benefits. Actually, I wanted to design something that is really mobile and that is why it is actually based on outpatients. I know that from my experience, uh, when I used to run a hospital, that actually the vast majority, close to more than 90% of gynecology or women's services can be provided in an outpatient setting. Uh, so, okay. So some of the services that I noticed, and this is where design thinking comes in, because I didn't just sit in the room, look at what we already have, because then what I will do is that I will produce the, the traditional pro product. So what we did is we got a group of many groups of young women in, in my company, in the community, and we asked them, we don't talk about insurance, we said, tell us about how you use healthcare. And that's when we realized, actually, number one, people like to look beautiful. They also, in, especially in, among Chinese, you know, many people wear glasses. Well, actually, refractive surgery so that they don't have to, LASIK surgery, is very popular. And of course, fertility in Hong Kong and many Asian countries are dropping. So people are getting married when they are older, having children when they are older. So fertility is becoming an issue. And of course, if you cannot find your life partner in time, then freezing egg might have to be an option. And of course, maternity care. Um, so we have, and then we tested some of these ideas. Then we also asked our distributors does it chime with all the women's lives that they are aware of? And this gave us some further insight on how women live their lives. I also spent a lot of time just walking in Hong Kong to Causeway Bay, to Mongko, just looking at how women live their lives, how they go about their lives in the community. And then last but not least, of course, I talked to the obstetrician and gynecologist. Because they are the women's doctors, they see them every day. I ask them, what problems do they actually come to you with? And how is the best way we can help? And uh, my colleagues uh, in, in, the medic, uh, in, in, in obstetrician and gynecologist, uh, especially Dr. Chen, uh, was fantastic. And as you can see, ah, you see CUHK is our partner. Now, we talk, Edmund talk about ecosystem. In order to develop something that is really patient-centered, 
customer-centered. You have to do it in an ecosystem so that the whole experience, you come back to patient-centered design, the whole experience is seamless and it guarantees first-class care. So I can't tell, I can't do it if everybody is, you know, you go out there and, and, and you, you, you look for care that you want peace of mind and transparency and dependability and, and, and so on. So what we did was I went and worked with our partners and the first two are our hospital partners and they actually have clinics. So these are all outpatient services, as I've said. Uh, so those two top hospitals in Hong Kong are our partners and also we have clinics uh, out uh, for eyes and, and, and beauty, and we have vetted them because often people don't know. They spend a lot of time on beautiful, looking beautiful, and, and, and they're hugely expensive, but you're not guaranteed the results, including fertility care. We know that the quality of, of successful fer fertilization varies from clinics to clinics. So I thought, why don't I vet, why don't I accredit, check out all the best providers? And then I not only help my customers, but I also help the best providers so that they can continue to be at the forefront of uh, innovation. Uh, so that's the customer journey. We did a lot of mapping out. And this picture is actually uh, the, the uh, executive committee of uh, Hong Kong, uh, XR Hong Kong and, and Asia. I put it there because when I designed the product, I also thought about the community and about the social purpose. So uh, I was able to uh, put aside a, a part of the premium to contribute to Hong Kong Cancer Fund. And Hong Kong Cancer Fund also, we, we promoted the Pink Day to raise funds. So by Every product that we sell, we also contribute to the community. So this is something that I'm really proud of uh, because I think in future, we no longer think about one person. We think about community. It takes a community to raise a child, as we all know. So um, that, I think, is the end of my presentation. And thank you very much. Mm, thank you very much, Iman. I think it's, um, it's very fortunate you know, um, to have a design thinker at the helm of the business. You know, particularly, you are an experienced hospital administrator before, and now running insurance company, and you are able to reimagine, you know, what the business could be or should be, you know, for the future. I think that's about, you know, the spirit, you know, of uh, business of design week. It's always about, you know, discovering and reimagining new pathways and new possibilities. Now, um, we've got about, you know, half an hour time, you know, for the conversations and together you know, with uh, Stacey and Larry. And um, I think let's, let's do it this way, because um, every one of you, you know, have started off with something I'm sure that you can talk for hours or even develop into a curriculum, you know, so to speak. Now, um, Stacey, I would like to start with you. Okay? And I heard and I read so much about you know, the aspirations, um, particularly with you at the uh, Design Institute of Health in Texas. And there's so much, you know, uh, renovate. Uh, there, there's so much, you know, um, major system innovations being put in place. Okay, architecturally, um, um, infrastructurally, and service-wide. How do you actually, how do you actually navigate all this complexity and implement design thinking? And it's a fantastic question because I think there's one fundamental truth. If you're designing for systems, you have to first recognize that systems don't answer to a single authority, right? There's no one person who says, hey, this entire system is going to work this way. I'm going to design it. I'm going to deploy it. And it's going to work perfectly the way I designed it. It's not possible. It's not possible because systems are indeterminate, you know, and mostly, and especially in healthcare systems, they consist of predictably unpredictable people. So they'll, they'll never act the same way. So you don't design a system, but you influence it. And you can design how you influence it. And the most important thing to begin with is for everyone to see the system collectively. Uh, and so when we first arrived in Central Texas some five years ago, we asked, how is care funded and delivered in this region? Guess how many people knew the answer to that? Zero. So we ended up mapping the system so that we could all collectively understand the dynamics in the system, how the different incentives engender different uh, uh, approaches and interventions. And it's only when you begin to see the system together can you actually collectively begin to affect the system. So, so it's critically important to map a system and its exchanges, its priorities, its collisions. And only then can you begin to identify the things that the system, uh, system stakeholders want to achieve in common. Finding that commonality then is the key to actually setting targets 
which then the different stakeholders work towards. So, uh, you know, it's, it has been a really interesting study in the, in the overlap between systems dynamics and design thinking. It's a, it's a new field of inquiry, one that's been really challenging and also really rewarding to work on. Yeah, I suspect that, you know, it's, it's, um, it's um, long, it's, it's kind of a movement and a journey, you know, for your uh, uh, putting in place all this system change. In fact, I'm trying to integrate, you know, some of the questions that I receive, you know, from the, uh, from the, from the audiences here. You know, so many of them are actually interested um, to maybe learn a little bit more about the initiatives. You know, you talk about, you know, the, the, the directions, the framework, the approach. But can you name, you know, maybe a few examples and how you actually get started and what kind of change that you are yeah. trying to change and what kind of data that you are generating, you know, to support, you know, the, the uh, development? Yeah, absolutely. There's a there's a number of projects. I'll, I'll contain it to two very short examples, uh, so we have room in the panel to discuss more. Um, one of them is actually moving healthcare into a community venue, and we do that alongside a number of affordable housing projects. You recognize that housing is such a critical element to actually achieving health uh, in an individual and in society, and so as many of the affordable housing projects in Austin ha are being rebuilt, we're being gifted the opportunity to stand up not just medical services or dental services, but also mental health services and social service provision in the community in a hyper-local way. Um, that's critical if you're really going to intervene where people live. Um, and so you generate all kinds of data. It's not just traditional biomedical data. It's actually uh, uh, engagement, social connection, uh, um, the kinds of relationships that you develop. Those are things there. They're a little less distinct than the traditional hard biomedical data we like together, but they're actually just as important in actually um, understanding how someone's health journey progresses. The other one I think that's really quite important is um, we were tasked with actually rethinking the way the public um, uh, mental health system was built. So we're rebuilding the hospital here regionally, and rather than rebuilding a classic inpatient psychiatric ward, which is really um, an example of what happens when you show up too late, right? You don't wait for people to show up in crisis and then put them in an inpatient ward. You actually need to intervene before they actually have a mental health crisis. And a lot of what we've done on behalf of the state government and, um, and the regional stakeholders is to imagine a system that prevents people, prevents people from ending up in crisis. And that's actually much less expensive, not just from a healthcare expenditure standpoint, but also much less expensive from the toll it takes on each of those individuals as well. Right. Okay. Now, um, Larry, you know, Tom, I, I would like you know to throw some questions to you. But you know, the, the the rest of the panel members from Hong Kong, you know, you feel free, you know, to ask or, or share. Now, Larry, it's interesting. You know, when you design the new um, um, medical school, for example, okay, you talk about you know, Tom, it's becoming a team sport and it's becoming a data science, you know, perspective. And what kind of educational needs are required? for this paradigm shift, you know, this is huge. Now, even though, you know, we talk about we need to bridge all the disciplines, multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, we, we talk about that a, 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 a lot of time. But how do we actually prime people, you know, to get along, you know, with the change? Uh, such a big question, Edmund. And, and of course, when you look at it from the vantage point of a dean, she would look at it and say, well, what am I going to throw out of the curriculum? I mean, it's not like medical students are not already busy. So if you're going to, in addition to teaching them the pharmacopoeia and the physiognomy and the techniques of being a doctor, also teach them to do good teamwork and good data science, you don't have enough years to teach those doctors all of those topics. And I think that's what's so interesting about all of the things that your fabulous panel has been able to share. I've been listening to such a, such a stream of wonders, really. Um, and you're so lucky to have such modern and impressive care models emerging in Hong Kong with great technology and great caregivers, such as the ones that are on the panel. Um, what I'm thinking is that if I was a member of the audience, I would have my head swimming about now. And I think one of the things that might simplify most of these things for all of us, Edmund, is to just 
practice a good basic discipline that I've been teaching in the world's toughest design school for four decades. A great designer does a good job of standing a little further in the future and asking the question, do I want to live in that world? Would I want to be a doctor in that world? Would I want to be a nurse in that world? Do I want to live this way? And every time you find something that's annoying, that's irritating, that wastes your time, you ask yourself, what can I do to make that a little bit easier? That was what's so beautiful about the, the example of the, of the pink insurance. It was a complete shift in how you focus on a different kind of user. What Stacy taught us, and it was absolutely brilliant, is the way you change the system as a whole to be able to deal with the very complicated kinds of conditions. What we're hearing in the fantastic new innovations that are coming in the Hong Kong hospital is how you take state-of-the-art 5G technology. The simplest, easiest way to understand 5G is that for the first time in the history of cellular devices, things start to move at the natural pace that our human bodies move, at the, at the pace that our, that our visual systems work, at the pace that our mind needs to have information. And you can connect millions of devices in an operating theater all at the same time and always have that high speed and low latency. So things start to become connected, but natural and warm and human, responding at the speed that we find natural. That's an example of standing a little further in the future, Edmund. And I think the thing that all of the panelists have been showing one another, and certainly me, and maybe, I hope, your audience as well, is what it means to bring empathy and, and to bring heart um, as we try to solve the kinds of problems that are systemic and population-based, increasingly complicated and increasingly costly, and solve all of those problems simultaneously in, in the ways that we best can. Okay. Now, um, try to link back, you know, from what I hear so far, you know, to let's, let's talk about some of the governance system behind. <clears throat> because um, particularly in Hong Kong, you know, like many cities, you know, we, we want to promote, we're actually doing a lot to promote innovation and technology development. But what I hear very clearly, the message is technology must be deployed, you know, to, to serve purposes. Otherwise, you can just go out and promote technology, you know, without people feeling, you know, what the impact or outcomes that I'm going to benefit from. Now, so, so with this uh, um, smart hospital that in, uh, the CUHK Medical Center is going to be launched very soon. And um, do you have a system uh, thinking or, or, or a governance system in place to ensure the very components that you, are, you, you, you actually elucidate to us are actually seamlessly connected and, um, and, and governed in a way, because otherwise you will just become an administrative centered you know, practices, and very quickly you will become just sheer administration. And um, so can you say something about you know, this uh, forward thinking uh, uh, approach to your, to your new hospital design? Oh, well, yeah, well, uh, I think when we first started about four, four, four and a half years ago, and then we, we did through uh, a consultant uh, help us to develop an IT strategy and roadmap on mapping out the different major components that will be in place and how the relative priorities of all these systems are. And based on that, we develop different uh, project schedules and then, uh, and then start the development. So we got a, a, a basically a, a, a blueprint of all the different systems, how they should put together and then the relative priorities. And then, so, and then we also have all these uh, different governance uh, structure, uh, project steering committee, and then we've got a board level committee to oversee that. Uh, I think we, we do have that. But then uh, going back to the innovation part, and then so the, the control and then the innovation to some extent is a bit uh, conflicting. So, so, we, so, so we have to balance uh, how, how we encourage the innovation, okay, at the same time and trying to not uh, jeopardize the core development of, of the, the the main system so, so that's uh, that that we need to have a very uh, a good leader and also with very good uh, clear visions of what we want to achieve 
and then um, and try to look at the different in initiatives uh, in uh, uh, in uh, isolation as well. Well, good to hear that. But uh, Dr. Chang, you know, from the put your you know former cap on, you know, as the hospital chief executive, you know, you are foreseeing, you know, uh, looking overseeing the entire operations, and glad to hear so much emphasis put on patient-centered, you know, people-centered, you know, uh, development, so to speak. Yeah. But this governance thing seems to be very cold, you know, rigid things. But the entire talking, you know, here is about experiences, you know, for patients, for care workers, for doctors, for nurses, for people across the disciplines. Do you see a conflict? You know, can you actually build in this, you know, ideal governance system, you know, to ensure innovation is fostered and the care services is efficiently delivered? And, you know, what is our take on that? Um, for governance, I would say uh, it's difficult to have um, ideal, uh, ideal governance system. Um, but I can uh, think of three factors. Uh, n number one would be the uh, patient safety. You have to ensure a system. Because we, we are talking about innovation, something new, smart. Um, patient safety, I think, would be the first and also the bottom, bottom line. So everything we do, we have to consider patient safety. This is number one. And num number two would be the uh, legality and also the uh, administrative uses. Uh, just for instance, for Connect Health, um, everything can be done uh, in the internet. And you can connect anywhere in the world. For example, it is uh, the jurisdiction. We can be seeing a patient um, in any country. So, the jurisdiction is one factor. And as for administrative issues, um, uh, there are rules and regulations. And many of these are um, laid down um, many, many years ago at the time. Uh, nobody can imagine the advances in technology today. Um, so uh, they may not be able to reflect what's happening here. So we need to do something to ensure that we are not violating the rules and regulations. This is number two. And number three, as uh, Michael just mentioned, we have to strike a balance because we want uh, innovations. It's got to be something creative and design. We, we can't have too much restriction just, just to suffocate the design. So these are the three factors that comes to my mind. Mm, very good. Now, um, talking about, you know, Larry, you know, I like, you know, oh, sorry, Larry, did you want, did you put up your hands? Yeah, I did want to say a couple things about that. I I believe all of the three factors are vital and very well stated. What is now starting to happen in the frontiers of complex care is are two other factors that I think are really interesting. Historically, medicine has been very hierarchical. There's always a doctor in charge and everyone else is supposed to follow. When you look at complicated, say for instance, defense systems, um, special forces everywhere in the world and the way in which the greatest soldiers are trained, something happens when teams are extremely good. Instead of hierarchies, they emphasize skills and the interrelationships. And with a really great team, you tend to give them the goals rather than the rules. And that's new, especially when you can for complicated procedures, use simulators to get the team to practice its skills so that everyone really knows how to do their role especially well. And they can respond even when there are surprising things in the moment in ways that are well grooved. And I think that that's a new form of governance that is particularly appropriate for complicated, fast moving situations that you can't predict well, Larry, very interesting. That's all about, you know, how you recraft or craft, you know, the innovation culture of the organization, right? This, this is a big word, you know, we buzz it, you know, in, in Asia, in, in Hong Kong, in this city a lot. But how we do it is actually a, a mystery to a lot of people. And, um, and I guess it is very important that, you know, we, 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 we build this agility in our system. That's what I mean. You know, if the governance system is so rigid that becomes administrative driven, 
and we lost sight of the need, you know, to the meaning, you know, of the services that you're supposed to be providing to, and that's uh, that would be a disaster. Okay. Now uh, going to uh, Yemen, you know, I'd like to learn a little bit more. You know, to, um, um, when you implement, you know, this innovation culture, design thinking in the organization, was it a smooth journey, or what kind of challenges, what kind of uh, 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 difficulties you face? Really good. <laughs> Really good question. Well, as I think everyone will know, uh, no, insurance is notorious for fine prints, not paying out claims when you think you are, you are eligible for. Um, and also, of course, it's run by or, or, or led by actuaries who look backwards and not forwards, right? So it's not exactly the, the sort of the milieu, the environment that, where creative thinking can flourish. So the lessons learned for me is, I think one is stakeholder management, just like all management of change, um, internal stakeholder management is really key. And to get the technical specialists, as well as distributors, like agents and, and even uh, anyone who sells insurance, to think in a different way, to communicate in a different way, so that you are really thinking you are your, uh, your customer, your customers' partners is a different way of approaching things. So I think stakeholder management is key. Second, of course, is communication. We really need to change the, or replace the language that we use. Too much jargon, actually, I think it may be purposely done to, to, to wow you or, or, or but actually, I, I just feel that can we make it simple? Simple is good. And so I actually came to design. Uh, using design because simple, I feel, uh, actually that, that avoids all the transparency issues, understanding issues, and, and, and so on. And the, the, the third challenge is, is actually about getting the, the market to understand something that is new and different, right? You may, you may push out a really great product, but if the market, even not even internal, but the market don't understand because they are only used to a very traditional product, then it's not going to take off. So how can you engage the market, maybe through promotion, marketing, and, and all the you know, events like this? Uh, really, how, to, how do we educate? And I think this is where the ecosystem as a whole need to work together. Mm. Because so, for example, we heard about CUHK Medical Center and the use of technology. So if I, as an issue, if I don't cover this, then the patients will not be able to benefit. So I think insurance, we all need to join hands to work together to make sure that the whole ecosystem work really focus on the patient. And one last comment I want to make is some of the changes can actually be done to the uh, customers or human-centered care. And having worked as a hospital CEO myself, I, I, one of the things I believe, despite all the technology, internet of things, ultimately is about care, compassionate care, and also when you put the patient in the centre, make sure that the patient is informed. You could do everything, and I'm glad to see that in the new CUHK, you actually have medication for the patient and so on. But I remember that back in uh, when I was chief executive uh, about almost 10 years ago now, I said the one thing that you can do, and I said to all my consultants, is you make sure every letter that you write to the GP and so on, any exchange of communication, you copy the patient, so the patient is in the loop. So I think really we need to, it's not just tech, ultimately it's about compassion, ultimately it's really about the patient at the centre of care. Very good. Now, um, with the new hospital, you know, the, uh, Larry, uh, please go on. Yeah. Well, I just wanted to make a little surprising point for your audience. Um, the brilliant work that's been done in pink insurance was actually done about 10 years ago, not for humans, but for pets. Uh, all the world over, in Asia, in Europe, and in the Americas, people are insanely emotionally attached to their pets. And they're frustrated because dogs and cats don't live as long as humans do. So they're sometimes paying insane amounts of money to try to keep their pets alive just a little longer. And that has created a really amazing world of R&D for pet care that is state of the art and it's one of the best places to prototype care for humans. So more than 10 years ago, I helped clients to innovate in insurance for pet care 
so that you would know exactly if you were a young, uh, say for instance, woman in your first job, how much it was going to cost you to care for a dog or a cat that you loved, to care for it perfectly, to give it lifetime health care coverage and good diet and good medical coverage and good, you know, preventative treatments and predictive analytics about what that pet was going to go through. And all of the pharmaceutical companies and many of the medical research companies have put their R&D divisions in pet care because the liabilities are simpler, but all the technologies are the same. And so sometimes what you want to do when you want to see the future a little bit sooner um, and a little bit more clearly is you study where the innovations have happened a while ago, because it's the laboratories that we use for learning and development. Well, very great. You know, um, Stacy, um, I'd like you know to 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 maybe have a few sound bites from you. Um, how would you respond, you know, to 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 Larry's? You know, because um, a lot of um, friends, you know, in Hong Kong are very interested, you know, in the system change, you know, that is happening, you know, at, uh, in Texas, for example, and um, you know, is a lot of things are easy said than done. But you know, uh, tell us a little bit more. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you mentioned about participatory design with the community. Just a few more things to emphasize on that. Yeah, I, I think there's a couple things that are actually really important to note. Um, I'll pick up a couple threads from throughout this conversation. One is if you're going to approximate a consumer system in this new model of health, then you have to hold yourself to the same uh, metrics that we hold ourselves to in consumers. So you have to use net promoter score and see how you compare not just to the low bar that is healthcare, but to the high bar that is Netflix and all the great consumer brands that are out there. Um, you don't get to hide behind the, the, the veneer of healthcare anymore and say, oh, we're the best of healthcare, which is not really saying much at all. Um, there's a thing we often say, which is um, humans retain the right to self-determination, right? Your patients have self-will, and they will enforce that force of will um, when, uh, when given the opportunity. And so you cannot design with the presumption that you actually know best. You actually have to design in a way that allows them to manifest what's best, because what's best for them is different for every one of them. And it um, underpins, I think, a really important notion, which I don't know that we've touched upon yet in this panel, which is, you know, we often in healthcare think about, uh oh, we'll design something and then we'll deploy it, and then it'll be a best model of care. And it's actually a little bit disingenuous. It's a little bit silly for us to pretend like that model of care will persist for 20 years and remain good. Because does disease change within 20 years? Does technology, do consumer expectations? Absolutely. So there's this notion around the learning health system, which says that in operating your system, can that operation actually be your research? Are you creating closed feedback loops that allow you to understand what works, what doesn't work, what, uh, what consumers and patients love, what practitioners love, and immediately feed that back into a self-reinforcing system? I think that's one of the biggest challenges. Technology can take us a long way there, data use and things like that, but we actually have to do that with intention as well. Yeah, I think, I think it's very important that um, the panel actually echoed very strongly that do not presume, you know, as you said, do not presume that you know what people want. I think that is very important. Most of the time that, you know, when we, even, you know, when we issue a tender document, you know, a lot of uh, prescribed ideas already implemented. I think it's very important that we kind of, you know, put in opportunity so that we can have that kind of creative space put in, right? Yeah, yeah. Edmund, also yeah. on that, uh, what we also know from design science is that when you ask people what they want, it does not necessarily mean actually this is what they want. And that is what I love about design thinking is the observation, really studying and, and see what people actually do and not just take their word for given. Yeah. So, um, Dr. Chang, any, anything, you know, a, we only had a few couple of minutes you know, left, you know, any, any kind of messages that you'd like you know, to echo? Um, I would say for smart hospital or people-centered care, uh, we have to think of the people at all the time, not just um, for us working in the hospital, not just the moment you're seeing them. So you have to take um, what's happening in their daily life as just, um, uh, Yimin has mentioned. So this is important. We uh, consider what they need and also um, during the daily life, 
the general health, the lifestyle, everything. We have to observe all this when we design new products, new in innovations. Well, well, ladies and gentlemen, I think um, um, we are wrapping up, you know, coming to a close in a sense. It's very important that, you know, to, um, well, attending BUDW is always for food for thought, okay? And uh, the panel is kind of curated to give you some broader perspective. Healthcare is never meant to be a simple subject. And in fact, you know, the panel members already talk a lot about how we actually bridge the different interfaces. And in fact, there are so many interfaces from data, for example. Now, this is a, a, a huge, um, even lucrative area, you know, for a lot of uh, service providers and, and users, you know, to be, to, be, to be involved. Now, I guess it's very important that we stay humble and continue, you know, to build humanities into the system. Now, I think yesterday, you know, we talked a lot about, you know, the creative leadership, you know, from different segments, start with Tim Brown. And, and, and there's a lot of um, um, sense making that the more technology, the more advanced the sciences that we, we are in, the more important that we need to embrace the environment, to embrace our true self, embrace, you know, the humankind. Losing that, then we'll be losing the huge legacy, you know, of the values of being humans. Okay, and I guess you know the pandemic time give us a very blessed, in a sense, you know, to, uh, a reflection, you know, awakening call that we need to rebuild, you know, this uh, community sense and community spirit. Now, of course, for friends, you know, from Hong Kong, I think it's really great, you know, to learn that um, there, there are so much initiatives, so many interesting initiatives are being put in place, and I don't think many of us actually know it, and apart from knowing that you know, we are very aggressive in promoting use of 5G in the community. But 5G must serve a purpose. And now with this session, I hope that you, know, you can get a better sense that actually some increasingly, I believe, more user cases are being put in place, you know, to hopefully in, uh, uh, generating more benefits you know, to, um, um, uh, for the people involved. So I guess um, stay tuned with um, the BUDW. We still have many interesting sessions for you. Related to you know, the, uh, the health related, we have another session you know, to, uh, this evening talking about how design can add life to your years because the society is aging. Okay? And there's a, a lot of systems still in place. And how do we actually rejuvenate you know, the systems and bring the forward thinking uh, need you know, to that I think I um, 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 hope to see you at 8 p.m. You know tonight, and you will be going live as well. You know on View TV channel uh, 96. So um, thank you so much, and hope to see you soon. And stay healthy. Yes, definitely. 2021 will be another challenging year for the health sector. Thank you, everyone, for the great sharing, and thank you, Herman Miller, as our lifestyle partner.